such an honor to be asked uh, to be here today. I've been speaking to groups large and small for probably close to 20 years. Um, normally, I give uh, my story, my personal story, about being a victim of domestic violence. And I will give you a little bit about that story. I'm not often asked to give uh, a story about the after, what happened after the fact, because I've done so much um, talking about red flags and domestic violence and, and dating violence and relationship control and that type of thing that I was just so excited to talk a little bit about the rebirth that happens after something like this happens. Um, I was actually 20 years ago um, fortunate or unfortunate enough to date a man that I worked with. We were friends first and then we became uh, into a relationship and everything was fine for quite a little while and then uh, he started to be a little bit controlling. Um, not that I noticed, because I was born in a very small town. I have parents that have been married this year 60 years. I didn't know anything about um, domestic violence. I only knew about domestic bliss. So to have someone in my life that would show up um, places where he wasn't supposed to, uh, call me and ask me where I was so often during the course of a day, have someone tell me what I could and couldn't wear, um, to me this was a little strange. And I would ask him about it and say, you know, why are you being like this? Oh, it's just because I love you so much and I, I want to make sure that you're okay. And he was so concerned about, you know, whether or not I was all right. And at least that was the way it was put to me at first. Um, then it became a little bit more of a control thing where he would say, um, I don't want you to go there because I can't go with you. Or I don't want you to talk to this customer. We work together in a rental company. I don't want you to talk to this customer because He's a single guy, he'll hit on you, that type of thing. So it kind of moved into about four months in the relationship where I realized that I probably am going to have a problem with this person and it's not the kind of relationship that I want to be in. So I tried to tell him. Actually, it took me about nine months to try to get up the gumption to tell him that I didn't want to be with him because he was very controlling. He started to, he never physically abused me, but he would verbally control me and say things like, you know, I'll make it look like something happened and it was an accident. Uh, my parents had just put a new addition onto their home and he said, you know, I'll make it look like the Christmas lights burn it down, that addition to their home. And he would threaten my family and try to limit the amount of time that I could spend with my family and with my friends. So I was really afraid, but it got to the point where I thought, you know, I've really got to take this back. I've got to take my life back. I've got to step up and do what's right because I did not want to spend my life in this way. So I told him, wrote a letter to him, said, you know, I don't want to be in this relationship. I'm going to transfer stores. I'm going to transfer where I work so I don't have to spend time with you during the day. Um, and over Christmas and New Year's, I was able to take some time off. And I told him then, the week between Christmas and New Year's, I don't want to work with you. I don't want to be in a relationship anymore. Well, he stopped coming to work for like two or three days. Everybody was like, where is he at? Where is he at? And we didn't know. Well, he fi finally called in and said, I'm just taking some time off so that I can get my head together. So the day after New Year's Day was the last day that I was supposed to work with him. So I went into work and he was there and everything seemed to be pretty cool at first. And then I went back to make coffee and I just had this feeling as I was going back to the bathroom to fill up the coffee pot, something's not right. Something just isn't right. And I turned and I looked out of the bathroom uh, door and he was standing there with a gun. And he said, today's the day that we're going to be together forever. And I just looked at him and I knew exactly what he meant because in the course of our relationship, we had gone to see Romeo and Juliet at the college that I was going to. And he kept saying, I'm going to pull Romeo and Juliet on you so that we can be together forever. He thought it was great that they ended up together in the end, in eternity forever together. And I said, oh, no, you can't. You know, you're in, you're in big trouble. You've made a big mistake by bringing the gun into the workplace. And you know, his response was, I don't care about work anymore. I just want to be with you. And this is the only way that I can be with you. So we had a little bit of a struggle. And um, at one point, he had the gun up against my head. And I thought, what am I going to hear? Am I going to hear a click? Am I going to hear a pop? Am I just going to see Jesus? What's going to happen next? I don't know what's going to happen. And I heard this loud ring. This, and it was actually somebody coming in the front door of the place that we worked. He hadn't locked the front door before he came back with the gun. And it was a person that we worked with who this guy was never on time, ever on time in, a, in his entire history with the company. And it was 9 o'clock in the morning, and he was walking in the door at 9 o'clock. 
And I think, you know, this is the day after New Year's. Maybe he made a New Year's resolution like, I have a problem with time, I have issues with time, I'm going to be on time. Well, boy, he was on time. I can't even tell you how good his timing was because he came in, walked in, and saw me with the gun against my head, ready for this man to end my life. At this point, my boyfriend let me, my ex-boyfriend let me go, ran after him, and I went and locked the bathroom door, thinking I'll be safe in here, it's a big door, he's going to run and get help, he's going to get arrested. The next thing I knew, the door was kicked open, and my boyfriend, ex-boyfriend, who was standing there with a the gun, pointed at me, pulled the trigger, and I didn't know, I thought I peed my pants, because I felt this rush of, of what I really thought I had had an accident, and here it was blood. I looked down, there was blood just pooling, around my shoes. And I, I, I don't remember the pain of getting shot. I don't remember what it felt like. I just know that I was standing in a puddle of blood. And I thought, I'm going to die, because that's what happens, right? You get shot, you die. So I'm like, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And he says, now you're going to come with me. Well, I couldn't feel from like right here down. I couldn't feel. And I said, I can't go with you because I can't walk. So he half dragged me to his car, which he had waiting and running behind the store this whole time, so like 10 minutes, his car was back there running. We got into the car, and he put the gun against my head, and he goes, you're going to get it in the head if you try to get out. Well, I was already bleeding, so I knew you know, he was not fooling. So I said, OK, that's fine. We'll just go. We'll just drive. Everything's going to be fine. And I, I had this amazing spirit of calm. I, wasn't, I was panicked on the inside, but I was able to talk to him. And it was almost like I wasn't really present or something, because it, from that moment on, I was able to talk to him. He was a mess. He was crying. He was hitting himself in the head with a gun. He was saying, what have I done? And he would alternate from being extremely angry to being sorry, to being confused. And I thought, man, you know, if I don't keep him talking, I am a goner. And so I just kept him talking and mostly laughing. You know, they say you're not supposed to bring a knife to a gunfight. Well, I brought my mouth. And it's only always been my best weapon, I guess. That's what my family always said. And I thought if I can just keep him laughing, then he's not going to shoot me because people don't usually, ha, 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 boom. You know, they're not going to do it like that. So I just kept him. And I was like, OK, tell me about the gun. Um, what kind of a gun is it? What kind of a bullet's in my leg right now? And he would say, well, you don't have a bullet in your leg. It went straight through. And I'm like, oh, well, that's really interesting. Um, and he's like, yeah, pull up your skirt. And, he, sh and show he showed me, while we're you know, in the car, where the bullet was. And I go, oh, these are really good hose. What a great commercial this would be for legs. You know, it can, it, you know <laughs> this, is, this is really great. And, and he would laugh. He'd go, oh, I'm so glad we can laugh together like this again. And I, oh, me too, you know. <laughs> and I just kept going and going. And finally, he would get, he pulled in a couple different times and said, this is it. This is it. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill myself. And we got to a point like that where he would change his mind and then he would go on. We got to a point like that right at the Pennsylvania state border. He had taken all these little back roads. And I saw, you know, welcome to Pennsylvania. And he was like, oh, I thought we'd be dead by now. I'm so angry. And I want to kill you. And I said, OK, well, I think we need to pray then. Because if we're going to meet our maker, then I think we need to be ready. And I was brought up as a Christian. And the strange thing was, I didn't want him to go anywhere other than heaven either. I thought, you know, if, if this is really going to happen, and I really felt that it was going to happen, uh, we needed to pray together. So I made him pray the Lord's Prayer with me. And he looked at me and he said, now I can't shoot you. I've just prayed the Lord's Prayer. And I said, well, no, I guess you can't. So we got back out on the highway. And honestly, two, two minutes down the road, we were in front of a medical center. And I told him, I said, if you take me in there for help, for both of us, because we both need help, then I will marry you. I won't press charges. I'll be your girlfriend again, whatever you want. At this point, I had been bleeding about five and a half hours. And I wasn't bleeding, bleeding profusely like it was at first. It had stopped quite a bit. But I knew that I was probably going to get shocky. I was probably going to, something was going to happen, and I needed help. I knew that he needed help because he wasn't making a whole lot of sense either. And I said, you know, we need to get something finished here, and I don't want it to be our lives. So he said, OK, I'll take you. And he drove around for a while, and I said, you know, you need to throw the gun out of the window because if you walk into the hospital with the gun, there's not a whole lot I can do to save you. They're going to give you, you know, they're going to arrest you then. OK, that's fine. So he threw it out. And at that point, I thought, I can start to live again. I knew that I was not in major harm as far as him doing any more damage with that weapon. And we walked into the hospital. He, he got a wheelchair for me, put me in the wheelchair, 
took me in there, and I told him, I said, please go register us. The lady wanted to take me right back. She's asking us questions. I said, oh, it was an accident. And finally, we were separated. And I looked at the lady, and I said, please help me. He's been trying to kill me all day. Well, I think it scared her more, you know, <laughs> the poor woman. She was like, what, what? And she's pushing me, and I said, yes. I said, he, he had a gun. He did shoot me. We were involved in uh, something in Stark County, Ohio. So they called over at Stark County. They called their township police department. Their township police came, and uh, the hospital detained him until they were able to come. Stark County, once the officers got there, which was like an hour and a half, two hours later, that's how far I was from home, um, they said, ma'am, we have been looking for your body all day. We saw where you were shot at work. We saw the amount of blood that you lost. We had heard from your coworker that there was a gun here and that you guys had been you know, in a relationship and it wasn't going well. We really thought that you would be dead. And I thought, wow. You know, I had an awful lot of time to think about my life in that six hours that I was in that car with him. Um, but I never thought about the people that were looking for me, my parents, you know, I just kept thinking I'm not going to see them anymore. And that was the first time it dawned on me how much, you know, that probably hurt them too, that I was out like that and, and looking. So I was really very much um, worried about what I would find when they got there. My mother and my father arrived at the hospital several hours later after I was able to call them. And the first thing that we did was to pray for him because we didn't, we realized that his family was a victim. There's not just one victim when there's a crime. There's a, there's, everybody's a victim. My family was. His family was. His family name was in the paper the very next day. Um, they didn't ask for this to happen. So it was, um, it, was, it was a bad thing all the way around. So my mom and I prayed for him and said, whatever the outcome might be, we certainly hope that it, it's a good outcome for all of us. Um, I got back to Canton and started work again four days later because I thought, you know, nothing's, nothing's going to upset my life. I was in school. I was in my last semester to get the teaching degree. And I had worked so hard to go through school and to work my way through school. And I really didn't want anything to, um, to change that. I had big plans to be a teacher. So <laughs> I, I went along with everything the state had that they wanted me to do because I was also their, I was their witness to the crime as well as the victim. So I had to go and testify. And they prepared me, and I, I was able to get um, a counselor through the state, which they were very nice. It was a, the very beginning of restorative justice back in the early 90s, where they had a um, victim assistance program that I worked with. And I told them, because I was trained to be a teacher, I said, any time that you need somebody to speak um, on your behalf to get a grant or whatever, you people have been so wonderful to me. And so I went to the counseling. And this is kind of the after. This is kind of what happened after the case, because um, he did get charged with felonious assault and kidnapping, and he got 9 to 25 years. So after the fact, I was going to my counseling, and I really, I mean, I had him stumped, because I was so happy to be alive. I mean, I never really went through all the whole post-traumatic stuff, and my, and my counselor kept saying, you're just doing beautifully. You're doing beautifully. And I said, well, every day has been such an enormous gift. I mean, in that six hours in that car, I just kept thinking, I'm a goner. I'm never going to see my family again. All the things that I had planned and worked so hard for, it's never going to happen. So I just went to my counseling and was just taken every day. And I started about three months after I had this happen. Um, it was springtime. And I started to have dreams of painting, like I was a painter. Well, I was getting my degree in English, so I thought this is kind of strange because I had taken art classes in high school and was lucky to squeak by with a C. So I thought, gee, you know, why am I dreaming about painting? And my counselor asked me one day, he said, are you having any different kind of things happening? And I said, well, funny you should ask that. I'm having dreams about painting. And he said, well, paint. And I said, you don't understand. I can't. I've tried to paint. This is crazy. And he goes, well, sometimes people have things happen afterwards after they go through a trauma or something. Just try to paint. So I had some little art paints and little brushes and stuff at home. So I got those together, and I started to paint. Well, I wanted to show you one of the first paintings that I did, which totally blew me away. That's called For Reflection. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that was one of the first things I did. That was done with just some little acrylic paints that I had at my house. And I was blown away. And I still am blown away by what I am able to do. What I learned from this experience was that um, I had these big plans to be a teacher. And that's what I thought I wanted to do. I had my life. I had my life on track. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Well, when he shot me, 
I didn't die, but my life did because I stopped living my life because I was just overjoyed to have life, period. Forget about my plans. I got up every morning, put my feet on the floor, felt all my favorite extremities, and I was alive. It was wonderful. So I don't know. Uh, there's two schools of thought on this. Um, some people go, oh, you always had the ability to paint. And then this just gave you, you know, pause and, and gave you a, a reason to do this because you were so overjoyed with life. I prefer to think of the second school of thought was that it was a gift. And it was a gift to me because it's opened a lot of doors. Um, I stopped living my dreams and my things that I thought were, you know, for me to do. Because really, those dreams and what I thought I could do with my life or what I should do with my life actually limited me. If someone would have said to me before I was shot, you should paint. I can't do that. I've never done that. I don't have any ability to do that. Afterwards, it was like, wow, well, okay, I'll try it. And this is what happened. And after that, as I would, and I painted a lot, and I gave a lot of things away because to me, I'm alive. You know, this is a wonderful gift. I'm going to give these, these gifts of painting away to anybody who needs them for fundraising or for whatever. And people would come up to me at these events, and they'd say, can you paint a picture of my dog? Can you paint a picture of my kids? And I'd go, I don't know, because how would I know? I didn't know because I never painted anything before. So I would say, well, I'll certainly try. And I would get pictures emailed to me of children and dogs and, and houses and everything that they asked me to do, I could do. And I couldn't believe it. A lot of times I get this urge to paint and I just go and start opening up the paints and I get my brushes out and it's just like I hold the brush. God does the work. It's so awesome. And I'll be painting just like a little square at a time and I step back and I go, whoa, that is really cool. I just did that and I don't have any idea how it happens. People will say to me, can you teach my child how to paint? And I'm like, I don't know, I have to shoot them first because that's how, that's how it worked for me, I, I, I guess, because, uh, you know, boy, if I shoot them, boy, will they be able to paint then? <laughs> I really don't know. And I have tried to teach. I have just recently taken on a student. And it's odd because I, you really can't teach talent. And I really can't say that this is talent. It's more of a gift. So I just bought her a whole bunch of paints and said, go nuts. Go nuts. Don't say, I can't do that. Just go out and look at the sky and go, wow, neat sunset, neat colors, I'm going to paint it. Or look at the trees and go, wow, that's really pretty, I'm going to paint it. Because that's the way I felt when I started to see the, the leaves come out on the trees that first spring after I was alive, really alive. And when I would see a sunset, and you know, normally you're on the highway and just look at the sunset. I've taught my children to pull over and go, good job, God, check it out, look at the colors. You know, I can't do that. I can try to make it look like that. But that's really, really cool. So once you're alive, really alive, you can try anything. Now, I'm not suggesting that any of you go out and get shot and kidnapped. It's not fun. Rebirth of that kind does not come without its labor pains. And I've had a few. I did have uh, my post-traumatic stress showed up after I had children because I think I believe that um, in protecting them and that protective mode that mothers get, you realize, oh God, I don't want them to ever go through what I went through. So there's been a lot of sleepless nights, but boy, I get a lot of painting done <laughs> on those sleepless nights. And you kind of embrace those things that happen. I know you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, you, get a, you kind of embrace those things that happen as your unlimitations, not your limitations anymore. Um, so those things do happen. But I think that any of us and all of us have the ability to have that rebirth um, because everybody has known disappointment, everybody has known pain, everybody has known loss of some kind, everybody has known something of a tragedy. And if you can look at that worst thing that's ever happened to you and be able to say, well, that's the best worst thing that ever happened to me, then I suggest that you try to embrace it that way. I know it's hard sometimes. And I went through you know, a, a lot, and a lot of times that I think, you know, why me? But why not me? Because that's pretty cool. <laughs> and I'm just so excited that I, can, that I can do something like that. It isn't me. It really is not me. It's something that is um, much higher, much broader than anything that I would have ever imagined in my life. Uh, but my limitations would not have let that happen. So I suggest that you all try to embrace life and live it unlimited. Thank you so much.